We have a packed agenda today, so with no further ado, I'd like to welcome Matt Wood, Technology Evangelist for AWS, on stage. Thank you. Thanks, guys. So hello, everybody. My name is Matt Wood. I am the Technology Evangelist uh, for Amazon Web Services. I cover the whole of Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. And it's my job to answer any questions uh, that customers have about cloud computing in general, uh, talk to smart people such as yourselves about their usage of uh, AWS. And it's my privilege today to be here with you uh, to talk to you about some of the new things, uh, new features, new services uh, that we've been rolling out. Uh, so as Claire says, this always gets left to the end. Uh, so we really want to thank you uh, for being here. You're all busy people. Uh, so I really want to thank you. It's a privilege, really, to be able to be here with you today to talk about uh, what we're doing at Amazon uh, in the cloud computing space. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about what's new uh, with AWS. Uh, we roll features out uh, really quickly, uh, if you hadn't noticed. Uh, so I checked back on our blog and our newsletters that I'm sure you all, uh, you all receive. Uh, some of you may even be receiving them at this moment, because they're going out at the moment. And we're rolling out about eight major updates on new services each and every month. And so the feedback that we've received uh, from our customers is that it can be kind of taxing to keep up uh, with our rate of innovation. And so rather than slow that rate down, what we're going to do is try and be a bit more communicative uh, with events like this as to what these new features are, what these new services are, and how they fit into the, your usage of the AWS cloud platform. Um, so um, one thing I particularly wanted to call out, because I think it talks to the heart of what we're trying to do at Amazon, uh, is our price drops. Uh, so uh, with the Amazon cloud, we've dropped prices uh, 17 times uh, since we got started about five years ago without any real competitive need to do so. And all of you benefit from those price drops each and every time. And the way that we achieve those price drops is basically through better efficiency, better economies of scale. So as our business starts to grow, grow and grow and grow, uh, we can uh, operate our infrastructure in a much more cost-effective way. And it's our commitment to be able to pass those savings uh, back onto you, our customers. And a really good example of that uh, is with S3. Uh, so this is the uh, graph showing the growth of S3. We launched S3, the simple storage service, back in Q4 2006. And here you can see the numbers and how they're changing all the way up to Q4 2011. And we're currently at 762 billion objects uh, in Amazon S3. And we're dealing and serving those at a rate of around 500,000 peak transactions per second. So as we start to achieve more of these economies of scale, uh, we're going to be passing the savings back to you. And we did that recently with a, a price drop uh, for all the S3 prices. We're also committed to rolling out new geographies and rolling out uh, data centers uh, into new regions. Uh, this is what our global infrastructure map looks like at the moment. Uh, it's continually changing. It seems like every time we do one of these talks, I have to update my slides. Um, so now we have uh, three different regions. Uh, regions are what you can think of them as basically mini clouds that contain a collection of availability zones into which you can store your data and run your applications. So we've got three of those regions now on the, uh, on the uh, west coast of the US, uh, US east uh, over on the, on the east coast. We moved into South, uh, South America, in, down in Sao Paulo. We've got our data centers in Europe, in Dublin. We're also in Singapore and Tokyo as well. And we've committed to rolling out more of these. So if you want a particular region to be opened, let us know. And we're also rolling out uh, more and more edge locations uh, for CloudFront, our content delivery network. So we really recently rolled out new pop locations, uh, points of presence uh, in Osaka, Sweden, uh, and more across uh, uh, the east, uh, middle, and uh, west coast of uh, America. So we're committed to carry on doing this, and uh, we hope you guys uh, uh, like using these services. So in addition to these new regions, uh, we've rolled out a ton of other things uh, that I'm not going to have talk to, uh, time to talk about today. Uh, if you want to learn a bit more about these, uh, all the details are on our website. And uh, if you are looking for the sort of canonical source of where we announce these updates, uh, you can always check the monthly newsletter or our, our blog at aws.typepad.com. Uh, every time we roll out a new feature, typically at midnight, um, that's where we post them uh, as soon as the services are available. Uh, so we've done S3 object exploration, where you can schedule deletion of S3 objects useful for log rotation. Uh, we're gonna, we announced Windows on the free tier, so you can run Windows free on EC2. We're going to talk a little bit about VPC everywhere. Uh, we launched EC2 instance status, where you can poll and check the status of your, of your running instances and the infrastructure underneath them. And uh, just as uh, I was coming up on stage, I had to add Elasticash. Uh, which we've added now and is available in US West 2 and uh, in our South America region. So these things move very, very quickly, and we're not going to have a lot of time to talk about these, but uh, things are moving, moving quickly. So this is what we are going to talk about. Um, I'm going to start off by introducing DynamoDB, our NoSQL database service. I'm going to move on and talk a little bit about analytics in the cloud. Uh, then we're going to have a coffee break. Um, we're going to talk about cloud economics. We're going to talk about uh, integrating your enterprise IT uh, applications and infrastructure with AWS. 
Um, and uh, just again to show how quickly these things move, um, we did have to rearrange our schedule somewhat. So some of you may have seen this original schedule on the website when you signed up. Uh, but just last night, uh, we announced a new service called Amazon Simple Workflow. And so I'm going to rejig the schedule a little bit to try and give you a bit of insight uh, around uh, Amazon Sim Simple Workflow. Uh, it's been well received so far. Uh, we've had a lot of good feedback about it. So I want to give you an opportunity to learn a little bit more about it here. So we're going to talk about DynamoDB, some analytics work that we're doing, uh, Simple Workflow, and then we'll have a break for coffee and uh, we'll carry on after that. So as I'm sure many of you know, uh, the Amazon platform uh, is made up of a collection of tools, of building blocks, infrastructure building blocks that you can arrange in any way that you like. So we have storage services like S3 and EBS. We have compute services, uh, EC2. Uh, we offer a range of databases and a collection of ancillary tools and uh, premium support offerings to help you tie all of these bits and pieces together. Now, we've been innovating on your behalf across all of these. Uh, but just to get started, I, I want to talk about databases. Uh, so let's get started there. So when I think about databases, uh, I really think of databases in two separate groups. Uh, traditional, what you might consider traditional relational databases uh, that support uh, query languages, and a sort of newer breed of what are people are terming NoSQL uh, databases. Uh, internally, we call them YesSQL and NoSQL. So relational databases is just what I wanted to touch on to start with. Um, so of course, you're probably all familiar that you can actually run any database that you like on Amazon EC2. And we have customers that are running their own MySQL clusters. They're running uh, IBM DB2. They're running Oracle and all the rest of it, uh, which is certified for production use or, on AWS now, uh, Postgre, and any other number of relational databases that you, that you could imagine. Um, but there's quite a lot of pain and effort that goes into managing and running these services. And so uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, two years ago, we launched the relational database service, RDS. And this tried to take away some of the undifferentiated work of running relational databases in the cloud. So this is a managed MySQL and Oracle database service. Uh, in the same way that you provision compute infrastructure, uh, with RDS, you provision database infrastructure. And you do that with MySQL and also with Oracle. So it's pretty simple to use, and it has some really nice features. Again, designed to try and remove some of the common pain points of running databases in the cloud. Uh, so we have scalable uh, storage under the hood. Uh, you can run uh, storage on EBS beneath that. We have very rapid provisioning, so you can spin up test databases, you can spin up production databases, you can copy those into integration uh, uh, environments and all those sort of things. We have high availability options. Uh, so with a single API call or a single click, uh, you can actually turn on high availability features in MySQL, which means that you have a master and a slave running across availability zones. That's super useful. Again, something you can set up just on uh, EC2, uh, but which is time consuming to manage and, and set up and all the rest of it. So high availability options with a single click. And we have scalable compute. So you can vertically scale your database uh, depending on your requirements. You can move to higher instance sizes when you have uh, additional capacity needs and scale them back down because you're only paying for what you use. There's uh, a cost saving associated with that when you scale back down. Uh, we also announced ElastiCache. Uh, this is an in-memory memcached compliant uh, caching service. Uh, it basically forms collections of caching clusters. Uh, you can spin this up and put it in front of your relational database uh, or any database that you're running uh, to speed up uh, queries, uh, reduce the uh, overhead of uh, running those queries on your database. So ElastiCache now available uh, across uh, all of our regions, I believe, uh, and a really good service uh, to get your head around if you will need additional performance, particularly for read-heavy applications. Um, and when we think about high-performance databases, uh, I really think of them in, in terms of these three different characteristics. So as you try to increase the performance of your database, your relational database, you try and increase the throughput. And we have some services to help you to do that. Uh, so we have push-button scaling, uh, allowing you to scale up the compute uh, to allow additional throughput through your database, larger queries and higher number of queries. We also have uh, read replicas, which allow you to set up a collection of read-only slaves. Uh, you can then point your reporting or any uh, read activity to your slaves, take that pressure off your master database, and there's an asynchronous feed uh, with a replication lag, obviously, uh, back into the read replicas. The lag is uh, usually very, very small, and you can monitor that using our CloudWatch monitoring service. And of course, you can put ElastiCache or a caching layer in front of those databases to try and increase throughput further. We're trying to increase availability. And for that, we have this multi-AZ setting. Uh, so you can turn that on with your relational databases. And you also try and reduce latency. And so again, you can put a caching layer in front of your database so you get much lower latency in memory access to your data rather than having to go back to disk and go back to your database layer. But there is a problem with relational databases, and that is that performance typically decreases as the data set that you're working with and the scale that you're working uh, increases. 
So the goal of databases, when you're writing an application on top of them, is really to offer predictable, consistent performance. That's the goal, the blue dotted line. Here on the graph, we have scale along the bottom, and we have performance up the side, some measure of performance. So you want this performance to be predictable and consistent uh, for your application, so you know how long queries are going to take, and you don't want that to decrease over time. The problem with relational databases is that it's exactly what happens. As scale starts to increase, as you start adding more masters, more slaves, more overhead, uh, as you start to work with bigger data sets, queries degrade, query, query performance degrades really, really quickly, and that continues to dip down uh, as you go on, as scale starts to increase. And so really, as you can see by this big red box, this problem gets worse and worse and worse as scale increases. So the more successful your business, the more successful your application, uh, the worse your performance is going to be. It degrades with scale. Um, but that red box masks a whole world of pain, basically. There's a lot more problems in there than just degraded performance, uh, because customers then have to try and solve that performance degradation so you maintain that, con that goal of consistent, predictable performance. So customers typically turn to things like data sharding, uh, so putting uh, half of your customers on one database service, half of your customers on the other, sharding by surname or account name, number, and all that sort of thing, uh, working with caching layers and managing those. Uh, if you're not working in the cloud, of course, you have to actually go out and physically provision this new infrastructure in your data center. Uh, there's still, unbelievably, some people that work like that. Um, so provisioning can take a long time. Uh, some enterprise customers are used to three, six-month waits uh, between uh, signing off that payment order and actually getting the uh, bare metal uh, ready to use in their data centers. So provisioning can be a really big problem. Plus, you've got the whole management, of the over management overhead of the, of the cluster and any fault management that might happen. So everything fails uh, all the time. And that's typically true of computer systems. And so fault management it should be a big part of managing these, uh, these database services, uh, pretty much at any scale. So there's a lot of uh, undifferentiated heavy lifting. All of these things that I just talked about, data sharding, managing uh, infrastructure, um, uh, working with provisioning, this doesn't add any direct value to your business or to your customers. And so we consider this undifferentiated. It's just the cost of doing business. It's stuff you have to do to get done what you're trying to do in the first place, get your project to market, iterate more quickly. Uh, and uh, at Amazon, when we see this undifferentiated heavy lifting causing pain for our customers, uh, we like to try and innovate and produce new services which solve these specific problems. And so we did that. Uh, we launched this a new service, DynamoDB, uh, a couple of months ago now. It's been relatively well received. And DynamoDB is a fully managed NoSQL database service. Uh, so this is something that you can just switch on as and when you need it. Uh, it's a NoSQL database service, and it tries to address some of these common pain points of dealing with uh, data sets. So it offers extremely fast performance. Uh, it's backed on SSDs uh, to make sure that that, uh, that is uh, true. And it's more importantly offers consistently fast performance. So irrespective of the size of your usage, irrespective of your size of your data sets, uh, DynamoDB will scale to offer consistently fast performance. And it offers seamless scalability. This means that it will scale up and scale down. It'll manage your data uh, reprovisioning under the hood for you. All you've got to do is worry about putting the data in and then getting the data out when you need it. Seamless scalability as you need additional scale. And we'll talk about how that works in a minute. So some of the highlights, uh, we deal with very, very low latency. So you can expect uh, single digit millisecond latencies uh, on DynamoDB. Uh, so it's less than five milliseconds for a read and less than 10 milliseconds for writes. Uh, and all of this, as I said, is backed on SSDs. Uh, that's how we get it to be uh, so fast. And this is uh, uh, very, very important if you're dealing with uh, high throughput services. So anything to do with social gaming, anything to do with analytics, anything where you have a lot of the velocity of data is uh, high and growing. So single digit millisecond latencies. And here you can see some, uh, some internal figures of the read latencies. So the blue line is the average. Uh, we've got P99 and P99.9 uh, performance figures. And this is milliseconds up the side. So you can see just how consistent that is as, uh, as reads go on. We're also dealing here with massive scale. So there are no table size limits uh, with DynamoDB. And you have unlimited storage under the hood. Uh, so you can scale up as much as you need to uh, without having to worry about provisioning the database underneath, and without having to worry about that consistency of performance degrading as your database grows. As I say, seamless scale. So we do the live repartitioning of your data under the hood. You don't have to worry about um, maintaining in, uh, um, instances or provisioning instances or managing them when they fail and all those sort of things. DynamoDB handles all of that for you. Uh, you just work on your data model and on your application, 
and then think about the throughput that your application is going to need. So the goal here is to really create a zero administration uh, database service where you can just uh, start and get using, start using it straight away. And again, we're aiming for uh, predictable performance. And we do that through something called provision throughput. And I'll talk a little bit about exactly what that means in a second. Um, just because it's fast doesn't necessarily mean that it's all in memory. So DynamoDB has durable and available data, data storage. Uh, it's consistent, and it has disk-only writes. So you get the acknowledgments when a write has been is succeeded only when that has been written to a physical disk and when that has been copied uh, across multiple data centers. And again, zero administration. I can't stress this enough. Managing databases at any sort of scale, managing masters and slaves and instances can be very, very time consuming. And it takes your eye off the ball. It takes your uh, attention away from working on your project and growing out your businesses. So zero administration on DynamoDB. So I mentioned their provision throughput. Uh, this is the tool that we use to get this predictable uh, performance. Uh, so let's dig into this in a bit more depth. What is provision throughput? So provision throughput allows you to reserve the required IOPS levels that you need for your application. So you can do this per table. Uh, that's what we call a, a collection of, uh, of items in DynamoDB. You can set this uh, when you create that table. And you can also scale it dynamically via the API or, again, through the, uh, through the command, uh, through the um, web management console, and scale that up and down. So you have a reserved level of IOPS that your application needs, and that's how we deliver that consistent uh, level of, uh, of performance. Uh, this is the sort of JSON query that you might make. Uh, this is part of the API. So when you first provision your new table, uh, you do just give the provision throughput. So you tell the number of reads per second that you want to make and the number of writes per second that you want to make against that database. DynamoDB will go off, provision all the infrastructure necessary to give you that, um, that predictable provision throughput uh, going forwards. And you can adjust these using the API whenever you need to. And you can scale at any time. So one of the goals of DynamoDB was that there would be no downtime during scaling. So on uh, relational databases, typically, uh, when you need to scale up, add more storage, or add more capacity, you need to freeze that database. You need to go into a maintenance mode in order to be able to scale the infrastructure beneath it. Uh, that's not true with DynamoDB. Uh, you can scale with, uh, without any downtime. You just make the API call, change the requirement of your IOPS, and DynamoDB will make sure that the, uh, the changes are made under the hood, but the database remains available. So you can scale without downtime. And uh, you basically pay for throughput. So this is how you're actually going to pay for it. So you pay for those reserved IOPS. Um, so the pricing breaks down a little bit like this. So per one kilobyte item, uh, you pay uh, one cent per hour for every 10 writes per second. Got it? Ten, one cent per hour for every 10 writes per second. And one cent per hour for every 50 strongly consistent reads per second. And these basically evaluate to what we call read and write units. So if you're in the console and you see reference to read or write units, uh, this is what we, what we talk about. 10 writes per second is one write unit. 50 strongly consistent reads per second is one read unit. You can get double uh, the amount of reads per second for the same price if you're happy with eventual consistency. So if you don't need strongly consistent reads, uh, you can opt for that in the API and get twice as many consistent reads for your penny uh, as you do with uh, consistent reads. Uh, sorry, inconsistent reads as you do for consistent reads. So that's all per one kilobyte. So to work out your pricing, you basically multiply the writes per second times the uh, size of your item. That's the attributes in, that you're going to store in Dy DynamoDB, and that's the, the price that you're going to pay per 10 writes per second. And it roughly works out to this. So per, again, one kilobyte item, uh, it's around 28 cents per million writes and around uh, 5.6 cents uh, per million uh, strongly consistent reads. So it's a very cost-effective solution. And ultimately, uh, uh, in addition to that, you pay for storage under the hood. So you're going to pay a dollar per gigabyte per month of index storage. So that's how the payment breaks down. This is what the data model looks like. Uh, it's uh, a table, as you might expect. Uh, it's called a table in DynamoDB parlance. And inside those tables, the cells, if you like, uh, we refer to those as items. Uh, so here we have an item, which is a collection of key value pairs, basically. Um, we have an image ID at the top. Uh, that might be a primary key. We can have a date, uh, a title, which is a flower. And each of these can have, uh, have a particular type. So we can support numbers and strings and collections of numbers and collections of strings, as you see with tags at the bottom here. So we tag this with a collection of strings. And I can fill those, uh, those items, these uh, collections, buckets of uh, key value pairs up in my database and create as many of those as I like because I have unlimited storage under the hood. 
You access these uh, through the primary key. Uh, so you elect a primary key when you create your table. Um, so you just go back and you can uh, request by ID, for example. Uh, but we also support composite key queries. Uh, so this is useful if you want to have uh, a primary key and a secondary key, which may be a range. So for example, you could ask DynamoDB, give me all of the orders uh, for this customer within this date range. So you can do ranged queries against composite keys with DynamoDB. This is what it looks like in the console. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, so the table name, you give it the primary key. Uh, you say whether you want it hashed, which is a single primary key, or hashed with a range, which is the composite primary keys that I described. And you can give it the attribute name, whether it's a string or a number. Uh, and that's it, pretty much. You click Continue. Uh, you provision the throughput capacity that you need going forwards. Uh, so your read capacity units, your write capacity units. And we've also got a little calculator there. So if you check the checkbox, it'll ask you how big your units are and uh, all the rest of it to try and guide you through to give you an estimate of the amount of IOPS and the, the price that you're going to pay for the capacity. Uh, in addition to that, we have uh, a DynamoDB hooked into CloudWatch, our metric service. And uh, we also, by default, allow you to create a, a basic alarm. Uh, so this will send uh, an SNS notification, a simple notification service notification, uh, when your table's request rate exceeds uh, a certain percentage of your provision throughput. Uh, so here, you can, uh, it will tell you this will uh, be triggered when read capacity is consumed over 800 IOPS, uh, or write capacity uh, units are consumed above 400 uh, write capacity units. And you can enter an email address there, and it will send you an email when you're starting to, uh, starting to reach the limits of your provisioned uh, IOPS, and you can make a decision about whether to scale that up uh, when you want to. Uh, it's a really simple API. So it's really simple to integrate this into your application. This is one of the things that I think is most interesting about DynamoDB. There's only 12 API calls in the whole documentation. So you can read through it uh, really, really quickly and uh, without any trouble, and you can start using it straight away. We also have atomic increment and decrement on number attributes. Uh, so you can do that across the whole table. And if you do want to trigger automatic scaling, so by default, we'll send you that email. Uh, but really, it's just a simple notification service uh, alert. Uh, so if you do want to trigger automatic scaling, you can just subscribe to that SNS topic, and you'll get that programmatic notification as you're starting to reach the limits. So it will do the email address for you automatically, but you can also subscribe uh, pretty much anything else, so uh, text message alerts or programmatic endpoints that will get pinged uh, when you start to reach the limits of these, the uh, requested IOPS uh, that you have in place. And uh, you could, for example, uh, write the following script. Uh, so here's a really, really simple script. Uh, it's in PHP. Uh, my apologies to my Ruby brethren. Uh, but right at the top here, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to get the, uh, the resource. So we're just going to call the DynamoDB table. And this is code which is going to be triggered when we start to reach, uh, let's say, 80% of our provision throughput. Uh, we'll get from the API uh, the provision throughput in terms of read capacity and write capacity. And then we'll just double it. And we'll issue that back and commit it back to the table. Uh, give the update table command, uh, one of the other API calls, give it the table name and the new uh, provision throughput there, and DynamoDB will go off and uh, increase the throughput for us. And we could have something similarly to scale down uh, when we start to reach uh, another operational threshold and our capacity uh, needs start to decrease. So there's uh, strong consistency in DynamoDB. Uh, so writes are always consistent. Uh, reads are consistent or eventually consistent. Uh, they're eventually consistent by default. Uh, but you can choose when you make the request whether you want to make consistent reads or eventually consistent reads. And eventually consistent reads are much cheaper to do at the infrastructure level, so that's why you get more of them uh, per, uh, per read unit. And very high levels of data durability. Uh, so writes occur to disk, not to memory, uh, so you don't have to worry about individual instances failing and those writes not being committed back to disk where they're easily retrievable. And writes are acknowledged once they have been made in two physical data centers. So we've got high levels of durability for your data under the hood as well. And this is the sort of thing which is very challenging to set up uh, on your own, running it on EC2. As I said earlier, we have high levels of availability. So we have region-specific uh, uh, tables. Uh, this is not AZ-specific, so you don't have to worry about availability zones. Uh, but we'll continuously replicate your data across availability zones without you having to do anything. So you get high levels of availability with DynamoDB as well. There are a few considerations you need to make uh, when working with DynamoDB. Uh, so uh, you can only query DynamoDB tables uh, by, uh, by their index, their primary key, or by their ranged composite key. And so you can't make uh, generalized query statements against the data. Uh, now, this is a really good fit for a whole world of applications, uh, but you do need to think about whether that's a good fit for your application and where it would fit in. 
Uh, the throughput is provisioned in 1K uh, operations, as I said earlier. So uh, you have to think about the size of your objects, the size of your items that you're going to be storing. And uh, the maximum item size is 64K. So you can't store items larger than 64K in DynamoDB. If you do, you have to split up the attributes across multiple items. And you have to back up and restore using uh, uh, Amazon Elastic MapReduce. I'll talk a bit more about that uh, later on, uh, but that's a consideration as well. So uh, that's DynamoDB. Uh, that's our NoSQL uh, database offering. Uh, but I'm sure some of you are thinking, Matt, you told us earlier about another NoSQL database that Amazon offers um, called SimpleDB. Uh, SimpleDB has uh, some similar design goals as DynamoDB. It opts for zero maintenance. Uh, it's a no SQL key value store. Um, but it has a few limitations. Um, so it has a fixed limit. Uh, so you can only have a, a 10 gigabyte data set under a single uh, simple DB domain. And you can only store a billion attributes per table. And uh, there's no native data sharding in simple DB. Now, if you don't need that, simple DB might be a good fit. Uh, one of the advantages of SimpleDB is it has much more flexible queries than DynamoDB. Uh, so you can do SQL-like queries against all of the attributes uh, in your table. It will index all of the attributes. Uh, that means that performance can degrade as the data sets get larger. Uh, but if you have a smaller, manageable data set, a SimpleDB is uh, still a pretty good option uh, if you need flexible querying of that data. Uh, so it's really up to you uh, to choose uh, the right tool for the job. Uh, you can work with SimpleDB. It's not deprecated or anything like that. DynamoDB fits a slightly different use case and uh, is, a, is a great fit, uh, particularly at, at larger scale. We also have a DynamoDB free tier. Uh, so uh, we'll provide five writes per second and 10 consistent reads per second. We'll give you 100 megas storage. Uh, so you can start playing around with this, some of this stuff uh, more or less straight away. And uh, if your application fits nicely under these free tier uh, uh, provisions, uh, then you can use DynamoDB uh, for free, and you only pay when you start to exceed these limits or you want to have higher throughput or more storage. And with that, I'd like to open it up to any questions anybody might have. Uh, yes, sir, the back. Uh, we have a roving mic, Claire. The gentleman on the end, put your hand up, sir. Thank you. I had a couple of questions. The first one was you asked us to set the IOPS to a, a perceived uh, performance uh, mm -hmm. read and write speed, um, but it's actually charged on the actual writes or the consistent reads. Why are we not setting IOPS to a million reads a second on every single project we do? No, you're charged per provision throughput. So it's provision a throughput. provision model, not what you're actually using. And that's how you get this, performance, uh, this, uh, this persistent performance. I see. That makes sense. And uh, the last one was um, I've got a customer in mind that could use DynoDB uh, yes. quite well. The problem is they're, they're a bit anal about single point of failure. Mm -hmm. They are worried about Amazon going down into the hole and how do we have tools to be able to replicate Amazon to another service, mm -hmm. dare I say Rackspace, in this room without being kicked out? So um, we give you tools <laughs> to extract the data, right? Uh, so uh, DynamoDB has a lot of, uh, of um, uh, provisions in place to make sure that there aren't single points of failure. Is that through the API or? Uh, it's done under the hood, right? So we are can, we're always mirroring data across availability zones in the same region, for example. And we're making sure that writes are made to disk before we acknowledge them and all these sort of things. Uh, but if at any point uh, you want to uh, take your data out, uh, you can just extract that. It's just uh, an API call away, basically. So you can extract that. Uh, we also have tight integration, as I'll talk about in a minute, with, uh, uh, with Elastic MapReduce. So even if you've got very, very large data sets in DynamoDB, uh, you can spool those out using Elastic MapReduce, write them to a file, and then you can uh, do whatever you want with them. And there's some really good use cases for that, such as backup and restore, changing different, uh, moving data from one environment to another, from testing to, to QA, for example, and all these sort of things, or running analytics on it, which, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute. Is that clustering only US only, or is that to the, the Irish, uh, Irish um, uh, centers as well? Uh, EMR is available uh, in, uh, in, uh, across regions. Yeah. Perfect, thanks. You're welcome. Yes, sir, on the front. Thanks, Aaron. Sorry, one second, wait for the microphone. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, one of the questions uh, is about uh, the attributes that you mentioned, only the primary key is indexed. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything in the pipeline that's coming up? So you, you're going, are you going to allow us to uh, index other attributes in the future or not? 
so I, th I think that is great feedback, and that's feedback we've heard from a number of other customers. So nothing to announce today, uh, but I, I think that's, uh, that's something a lot of people would want. Okay. Any more? Awesome. Yeah, go right here, sir. Hi, thanks for the, the presentation. Can you, is it possible to set uh, a budget in advance so that you know, to avoid a runaway query consuming you know, huge resources? So with uh, DynamoDB, because you're provisioning the throughput, that's effectively the price you're always going to pay. So DynamoDB doesn't scale. You're paying for provision throughput whether you use it or not, basically. And so once you set that throughput, once you reserve that, that level of I.O., uh, that's the level that you're going to pay. So DynamoDB isn't going to scale on its own to provide more IOPS, uh, which is how you pay for it. So the only thing is that you, uh, you're also paying for storage under the hood. Uh, but in terms of IOPS, uh, you provision that and it's set. And it's up to you as the customer, as the user, uh, to increase or decrease that as, as necessary. And that's why we have these programmatic hooks, uh, which will call out uh, by email. So you can just go in and change it by hand. Or we'll make a, a programmatic call to a web service somewhere that you operate. And then you can make uh, um, business decisions based on that information. You can decide whether, at this point, I want to increase my IOPS because I'm seeing increased capacity, uh, or whether I'm perfectly happy to allow some of those to be uh, pushed back to the, to the application. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry, there's one at the back. Sorry. Uh, I'm off. <laughs> Hi. Um, does DynamoDB support any geospatial queries like MongoDB or Postgres for locational stuff? Um, I guess you could do it with a ranged query against the composite key, uh, but not natively at this point. Not natively. OK. I have one more. Sorry. Sure. <laughs> um, how about full text searches? So at the moment, we collate logs from a couple of thousand servers, and we use Elasticsearch. Mm -hmm. um, is DynamoDB a candidate for replacement? Because I like the flexible storage side of it. Sure. Uh, so again, not at this time. So nothing to announce uh, at the moment. Uh, the, the query model is limited uh, to ensure that we can give this provisioned, continuous, uh, uh, predictable performance. Uh, but again, that's great feedback and something we can take, uh, take back to our teams in Seattle. How long are you provisioning the input and output for? I mean, if you wanted to scale up and down, if I kind of scale up for an hour, can mm -hmm. I then scale down after an hour, or is it? So that's a really good point. So, so you pay for it per hour, I believe. Uh, and um, that sort of, the sort of follow-on question from that is how quickly does it scale up and down under the hood, right? So uh, this is actually a really important design consideration. Uh, so DynamoDB will scale down quite quickly. Uh, so as soon as you issue that API call, we're sort of typically talking in the, the minutes time frame for DynamoDB to start deprovisioning that throughput. Uh, but it can take slightly longer to provision the, uh, an increase in IOPS, particularly if it's a very, very big jump. So we have customers running you know, hundreds of thousands of IOPS on, on DynamoDB. Um, so it can take some time to scale that up under the hood. Uh, so our recommendation is that uh, if you know that there's going to be uh, a, storm, a storm coming, basically, uh, that you provision early to make sure that you have that, uh, all that provision throughput in place uh, before, before you need it. So for a classic example is uh, supporting a TV show or a mobile application which supports a TV show. Uh, when you know the TV show is coming on, don't leave it to the last moment to start to provision the IOPS that you're going to need. Uh, scale up a, a little bit in advance so that you can have the provision throughput ready when you actually need it. Any more for any more? Oh, we have one at the front. <laughs> is it easy to uh, measure your application to understand exactly how it is performing over the course of a month so you can begin to understand how yep. it reacts to events and yep. how much I've Absolutely, a really good question. Uh, so we publish uh, a, a whole range of metrics, including write and read I.O. Uh, into the CloudWatch um, monitoring service. Uh, so you can draw the graphs around how that's performing over time. Uh, you can look at your read and write latencies and graph those out over time. Uh, and of course, you can pull that in through the API so you can build out a custom dashboard if you want to as well and run pretty basic but some quite powerful reporting on top of those, uh, on top of those metrics. Uh, so all of those are exposed uh, by default by DynamoDB. Awesome. We have one more at the back. Mr. Gavin, thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, I just wondered, uh, when, you're, when you're actually setting it up, then do you have to say what availability zone that you want to use? So let's say if most of your systems were in one, or is it just where, uh, so, where will it hit? I suppose, yeah, so you, you specify it per region. Uh, so you don't have to worry about availability zones. DynamoDB handles all of that under the hood for you. Uh, but you just get to pick the region 
Uh, so if you're running most of your infrastructure, so the re rest of your web tiers, for example, in uh, EU West, uh, then you can provision DynamoDB there. And then within EU West, you have A, B, and C. If most of your infrastructure is in A and B, will it, will it hit there? Well, we, or? So we have super low latency between availability zones, uh, so you shouldn't have to worry about that. All right. OK, good. Thanks, good discussion. Um, so I'm going to press on now. There'll be more time for Q&A uh, when we break for coffee. If you want to talk about uh, anything else to do with DynamoDB, uh, just hit anybody up uh, with a Amazon Web Services t-shirt on. Um, so I'm going to change gears a little bit, but not, uh, not totally. Uh, I'm going to move from talking about databases uh, to thinking a little bit uh, about compute. Uh, so I'm sure all of you are familiar with uh, the Amazon Elastic Compute Cloud. Um, so what I was going to talk about a little bit uh, was how you can use that as a platform for analytics. So this ties nicely into some of the work that we've been doing around making it easy to collect up data uh, using DynamoDB, using the relational database service and all the rest of it. So let's talk about data, one of my favorite subjects. Um, so uh, data is super valuable, right? The majority of businesses are built out on the data that, the, uh, that they create, the data that their customers enter into it and all the rest of it. And we know this very well at Amazon. Um, data is also very, very plentiful and becoming more plentiful. So whether you're dealing with mobile applications, whether you're dealing with social games, whether you're dealing with a typical web application, there's a lot of data involved in that application running, uh, logging that application, auditing that application going forwards. Uh, but data is also super complex and becoming more complex. And it changes all the time. So the data that you're working with is typically in flux. Um, this can make it very, very challenging, uh, particularly when data is fast moving, uh, to manage and capture and work with this data pretty much at any scale. Uh, so we might hear a lot uh, about big data uh, these days, uh, but really I think uh, data becomes difficult to manage when it starts to exceed your experience in managing it. And so that's sort of my definition of big data. And it becomes very challenging to capture and manage data and actually try and derive some value from it. So we end up with, in a situation where we have lots of data, uh, where we have lots of uses for that data, there's lots of questions that we might want to ask of the data that we're collecting, whether that's uses or security logs or identity and access management, or we have a lot of users typically internally that want to ask questions of that data. So they have a lot of questions that they want to ask and they making that data available in a form that they can ask those questions can be challenging. And we typically want it available in lots of locations. Uh, so it can be challenging to move large data sets, uh, terabyte, petabyte data sets, uh, even down the hall uh, to somebody else that you want to talk to, uh, let alone moving them throughout a larger organization and allowing all of these sort of uh, use cases and all of your users, all of your collaborators, access to that data. And of course, the last one, you want to do it for as low a cost as possible. And working with very large data sets, in fact, data sets of any kind, uh, can be costly when you need to work with uh, redundancy. And that's why we offer that sort of level of durability uh, with Amazon S3. And all of these things basically act as a force multiplier in complexity in managing this data. Uh, so it's a force multiplier of the amount of data, the velocity it's moving at, the complexity of the data, the usage and the users of the data, and the locations in which that data needs to be accessed. So the biggest problem is how do you answer, how do you rationalize all of these different problems in working with these data sets to try and derive some of the additional value that you can out of these data sets? So we typically see customers in these sort of areas. So people working with uh, social graphs, uh, mining social graphs from social networks, uh, people looking at uh, click-through advertising uh, rates and click-through advertising trends. Uh, people just collecting out log files. Uh, there's a huge amount of information in log files. Um, audit trails of applications I mentioned, transcoding of media, uh, the logs and tracking the performance of that, and customer usage, so how people are actually working with your application. And typically, particularly with traditionally provisioned infrastructure, and as we're coming out of that era, uh, we've been very limited, we've been very constrained in how we can work with this data. We haven't had the storage, we haven't had the tools to be able to really ask questions of this data. And it's value which we effectively we've just been leaving on the table. Uh, so one of the things I love about the cloud is that it allows us to remove constraints. It allows us to start working with this data, asking questions of it to drive new uh, business opportunities, to drive new business processes. And uh, a lot of what we do at Amazon is to try and remove these constraints to allow customers to derive the value that's locked away in these datas, data sets. Um, so when I think about analytics, that is the process of asking questions of these data sets, uh, I think of it really in two types. Uh, one is data intensive uh, applications, that is scale out applications. Uh, some people refer to this as embarrassingly parallel problems. You just have a large number of input files, so you have a large number of log files, and you just need to keep crunching them as much as possible. 
Now, in a traditionally provisioned infrastructure, you're always going to be limited by your, your static upper level on how much, of, how much of that value you can gain from these large, large data sets. There's also a tightly coupled uh, set of problems, which I'll talk more about in a minute. So let's focus on data-intensive scale-out applications to start with. Um, so Hadoop is an open source tool uh, which a lot of people are starting to use to ask questions of these large-scale data sets. Uh, who here is familiar or has heard of Hadoop? Oh, cool, about half of you. Every time I ask that question, I get more hands, so that's good. Uh, so Hadoop is uh, an open source implementation, for those of you who don't know, of the MapReduce framework. Uh, MapReduce is a, a very nice framework for dealing with uh, distributed computing problems, uh, particularly with large-scale data sets, so a large number of log files if you want to search and index a large amount of, of, uh, of corpora of data. And Hadoop is becoming very, very popular in, in working with these large data sets. Uh, so about a year and a half ago, we announced uh, Elastic MapReduce. Uh, this is a managed Hadoop service. So in the same way as uh, the relational database service offers some common patterns uh, for working with relational databases and tries to make that as easy as possible, so Elastic MapReduce is managed Hadoop. It tries to take away the cruft, uh, the muck, of dealing with distributed computation so that you can focus back on asking questions of your data rather than worrying about how to distribute those out over a large grid and rather than worrying about how to store that data under the hood. So again, with Hadoop, what we saw, and you'll see this theme again and again at Amazon, what we saw with Hadoop was there was a huge amount of heavy lifting, undifferentiated work associated in building out Hadoop clusters and in actually writing MapReduce uh, um, uh, programs which could take advantage of this data, that could ask questions of this data, derive some business value from this data. And where we see undifferentiated heavy lifting, that's where we try and go after it and try and reduce that overhead as much as possible for our customers. So Hadoop uh, and Elastic MapReduce works a little bit like this. Uh, so you take your input data uh, and you place it into S3. Uh, actually, as you'll see in a minute, you can now also integrate directly with your data into DynamoDB. I'll give you some specific examples in a minute of how to do that. So you place your input data into S3, and uh, the majority of applications are already logging into S3. And if you're running on EC2, it's actually really easy to get your data directly into S3, so you can start processing it uh, with, uh, with Elastic MapReduce. Um, if you have a static data set, which you might have on your laptop or on that 10 terabyte disk that sits next to your laptop, I'll talk about how you can get that up into S3 in a minute. Then you take your code. Uh, Hadoop uh, runs Java code natively. Uh, but you can write uh, in any language that you want with Elastic MapReduce using a streaming interface. So anything that reads from standard in, uh, you can just place that code uh, up onto S3, uh, give it to the Elastic MapReduce service, and Elastic MapReduce basically takes care of all the rest. So again, this is something that you can just run on EC2 uh, that we've tried to make as easy as possible uh, to use without reducing the flexibility of the model. So Elastic MapReduce will go ahead and provision a name node. This is the orchestration node, if you like, uh, on EC2. This will coordinate the rest of the distributed task. Uh, it will spin up a fully elastic cluster, and underneath that run the Hadoop distributed file system uh, so that your data is, uh, is partitioned across the cluster. Each of the cluster has access to it. And you can start to run your queries and your business intelligent logic uh, directly against that HDFS uh, cluster. So you can run this very much as a data warehouse. In addition to just doing batch processing, uh, this is a great fit for data warehousing. Uh, and you can write those using things like JDBC or uh, query languages such as Pig and Hive, which are much more SQL-like. After that, uh, Hadoop uh, will run uh, in the Elastic MapReduce job flow, and it'll put the data back into S3 if there is an output, or it'll just stay running uh, once it, if you're setting up a data warehouse. And when it's finished, it'll just shut down all the infrastructure. So as soon as it's processed all your input files, it'll take those from S3 where your input is and uh, put them in the specified bucket uh, as an output. And some people also use SimpleDB for orchestration there as well. Uh, this is what it looks like in the console. If you're not familiar with it, I'm sure you've all seen the Elastic MapReduce uh, tab up in our um, increasingly busy console. Uh, if you click on it, uh, this is what you'll see. And uh, I encourage you uh, to hand in your evaluation forms. It will give you $25 of credit. And this is a great way of, uh, of, of spending that credit uh, to try and uh, start evaluating Elastic MapReduce. Uh, so we have a couple of demo job flows that you can uh, start to use just to see how they work. You just click the Create New Job Flow button there. And uh, you create a new job flow. That's uh, what we call them in EMR. Uh, you can run your own application. Uh, that will ask you for the location of your code, the location of your jar or uh, your closure code uh, in uh, S3. Uh, or you can run a sample application. I'm just going to run a, a word count application here. It's a Python script. Uh, we have the source code for that available on our website if you want to see how it works. But basically, it just reads from standard in uh, from a large collection of files. And I'm going to do a word count against a subset of uh, articles in Wikipedia. 
Click continue. Uh, you can specify, as I say, the input location. So this is where the input files are for the Wikipedia corpus that we're going to look at. We're going to look at the output location. Uh, so that's a S3 bucket that I've created. Uh, Elastic MapReduce will put the data in there when it's finished. Uh, we have a mapper and a reducer. Uh, these are for the, uh, for the MapReduce task. This is how Hadoop distributes out work. Um, click continue. Uh, we can specify the number of instances that we initially want to run on the Elastic MapReduce cluster. We can select the type of instances uh, that we want. So if you have a beefier job that requires more memory or CPU, you can just specify those there. Or you can run on a, a large number of M1 smalls. Uh, you can specify your key pair. So you can log into this uh, if you wish. Uh, using a key pair. It's just running on EC2 under the hood. And then we have an, a, some advanced debugging options here where we can collect up some of the Hadoop logs for you, put them in the right place, so you can start to debug if there's any problems. After that, you can configure what we call bootstrap actions. Uh, these are Hadoop-specific uh, bootstrap tasks, so you can uh, give, basically, Hadoop uh, input parameters as well. And after that, you can review everything that you've done. So we have a job flow name, the type, uh, all of the uh, input parameters that we specified. Click Create Job Flow, and uh, off Elastic MapReduce will go, starting to spin up your analytics platform, basically. That's all you have to do. So you can see here we've removed or having to worry about instance failure, instance provisioning, having to worry about uh, job flow or anything like that. All you have to do is write the code and provide it to Elastic MapReduce. So you get to focus back in on the questions that you want to ask rather than worrying about how to manage the data and how to store the data and then distribute that out so you actually uh, can, can run these distributed tasks. So along the bottom here, you can see we've got a job flow running. Uh, it's uh, it's going to be setting it up to start with. So we've got the description tab, which basically just echoes your, your input parameters. Uh, you can see the number of steps uh, that are going to be taken by Hadoop. Uh, so this is going to be starting the streaming job. You can see that it's in a pending state to start with. And again, echoing back the jar file that we're going to be using uh, for, for Hadoop and the arguments that we specified. Some bootstrap actions, so we're going to configure Hadoop with those. And the instance groups. So here's the master node that I talked about. This is the name node that's going to do the coordination tasks for us. And then the uh, nine nodes that we're going to spin up, which are actually going to be our workers. They're actually going to set about trying to uh, answer these questions for us. So uh, that will basically start running. Uh, it will move the status to completed when it's finished. And after that, you can go off. Uh, you can see in the instance group uh, that they're in a, a state of ended. And that means that they've all been terminated, basically. So Elastic MapReduce has even terminated the, app, the, the architecture, uh, so you no longer pay for it when you no longer use it, and the jobs have been run. After that, you can just jump to S3, uh, jump to the uh, bucket that you and the folder inside that bucket that specified the data, and you can see there the different parts of the data set that have been, uh, that have been counted. And you can pull them up in your favorite text editor and move that on for post-processing or get the answers out that you want. So that's a very, very simple example. Uh, but the amount of work that even that simple example would take uh, using just Hadoop uh, on a traditionally provisioned infrastructure uh, can be challenging and, in most cases, prohibitive, cost prohibitive in provisioning the infrastructure and in taking the time to learn, out how, to learn how to run it. Uh, we have a couple of nice additional tools that we've added to Elastic MapReduce uh, recently. Uh, the first is a nice distributed file copy tool, uh, so you can make sure that your data is moving as efficiently as possible in a distributed manner to back to S3. But under the hood, it's all just Hadoop. So once you are up and running, uh, you can go off, learn about Hadoop, uh, take all of your existing Hadoop skills, and start asking questions of some of this data. And like I say, if you are familiar with Hive, um, Pig, Cascading, and the streaming interface, uh, they're all available to you as well, uh, natively on Elastic MapReduce. It's API-driven, uh, so it's really easy to integrate into the rest of your workflows. We'll talk a little bit more about workflows in a minute. Um, we have customers that will spin up many hundreds of uh, Elastic MapReduce jobs and many hundreds of Elastic MapReduce clusters each and every day to ask uh, uh, questions of the current running state of their business. So they want to know what is the pulse of the business? What is the number of users? Well, how many checkouts am I getting? How many failed checkouts am I getting? What trends am I seeing across the different parts of my, of my infrastructure and the different parts of my business? And Elastic MapReduce allows you to do that and integrate that, again, into existing dashboard and ask uh, questions uh, and automate it through an API. So a few, a few notes, uh, a few words on data movement. Uh, so Elastic MapReduce is uh, a fantastic service. Uh, it works very, very well if your data is already in S3. But as I say, there are some cases where uh, you may be coming from a legacy provider. You may have a data set uh, which is housed uh, in-house for some reason. Uh, so how do you get that data up into S3 in the first place? Uh, so a while back, we uh, introduced import-export. Uh, this is a service which allows you to basically ship us a hard disk. Uh, so if you do have data on a hard disk, uh, we'll accept hard disks up to, I think, 12 terabytes at the moment, maybe even larger. Uh, and you can just ship those to us. 
tell us the location that you want the data in, and we'll put it into that location for you in S3, and then we're pretty good at shipping things around the world, so we'll send the disk back to you at the end of it. And this is also really useful if you want to take your data out of S3. Uh, so if you just send us an empty hard disk, tell us the data that you want removed, uh, we'll load it onto the hard disk for you and ship the hard disk back for you. So uh, if you want uh, off-site backup, if you want additional redundancy, if you want to stop using S3, uh, then you can just take your data back. We want to make it as easy uh, to, to do that as possible. Uh, we also have large object support. So S3 now supports objects up to five terabytes in size. Uh, and we have multi-part upload. So if you do have sufficient capacity locally, you can actually upload your large files in parallel. So you don't have to start at the beginning and work at the end. You can start at a number of points in your file, upload them all uh, into S3. S3 will bundle them back together as an object once they're up there. Uh, so you can maximize the, uh, the throughput of your local connection to get the data up there. And what we see commonly is that whilst the initial data upload uh, may be taxing, if you're working with terabyte or petabyte data sets, uh, it can take a couple of days, a couple of weeks to get it up there. But often the delta, the running delta of that data can be quite small. And so it's uh, actually uh, relatively trivial once you've uh, gone over the initial hump. And that's why we make these services available so you can get that up there as quickly as possible. And we'll talk a little bit later on about how you can further integrate enterprise applications uh, using things like Direct Connect uh, to really maximize the throughput uh, get uh, very low latency access and reduce your bandwidth costs uh, of getting data up into AWS so that you can run these sort of uh, business questions, business analytics, um, data warehouses uh, up with Elastic MapReduce. We also have a number of uh, features which we've uh, launched recently around scale control. Uh, this basically allows you to resize running job flows, something that's very difficult to do uh, natively on Hadoop. Uh, but which we now uh, support natively on Elastic MapReduce. Uh, so uh, this allows you to make some decisions around how important it is to have the results, how important it is to have the answers to your questions uh, in a time which is suitable for you. So you may have a cluster uh, which is running, uh, and it's going to take 14 hours to compute your data. Right? So you've got a reasonable size data set. You're running a reasonably complex query or set of queries against that. It'll take 14 hours to compute the answer. Uh, if you decide that you suddenly want it more quickly, it's suddenly uh, there's a business reason to have it uh, uh, have that speeded up, well, you can just increase the amount of uh, instances that are available to you. So you can decrease that in half just by throwing more metal at the problem. Because Hadoop is distributed, it'll add more clusters, distribute out the data, distribute out the work across those uh, pretty quickly. Uh, and you can go beyond that. So if you really, really need it, like yesterday, uh, you can spin up as many instances as you want. Uh, Hadoop will scale nicely to around 1,000 different uh, instances, uh, so you can get that time down uh, as much as you want, and you get to make the decision about what the cost benefit is for you. So you get to balance cost and performance because of this pay-as-you-go model that we have. You can also resize based on usage patterns. Uh, so, for example, if you have a data warehouse, you may have a steady state. Uh, this is just as you would scale up and down a web application architecture. You can do exactly the same thing uh, with your analytics. So you may have a steady state, uh, which is running most of the time. This will handle all of your repeating jobs, all of your cron jobs, all of your analytics, which may run throughout the day. Um, but then you may have some additional batch processing that, is processing that you need to do, some additional on-demand reports that people are running within your organization. Uh, you can start to scale up uh, that batch processing, scale up your data center as and when you need to. So just like you can scale up a, a web architecture, you can also scale up your analytics. And this is very, very difficult and typically cost prohibitive to do uh, when you're not running in the cloud. And also, we support the spot market. Uh, so Glenn is going to talk a little bit about the spot market after we've had some coffee. Uh, but the spot market allows you to have very, very low cost compute, and it allows you to choose the price of your, that compute. And it's basically perfectly made uh, for batch processing. It allows you to get very, very low cost, uh, uh, large amounts of data uh, compute. Sorry, uh, We have a customer, for example, that recently ran a 30,000 core job uh, on the spot market using exclusively spot. And for that, we charge them just $1,200 an hour. So it's a very, very cost-effective way of getting a large amount of compute. And it's integrated with DynamoDB. So once you've collected uh, the data, which is moving at a fast velocity, uh, which is growing in volume and growing in complexity, and you can handle that using the key attribute patterns uh, found within DynamoDB, you can then integrate that back into your analytics. Uh, so we make it really easy to call out to DynamoDB uh, from, um, from Elastic MapReduce. And you can also back up and restore uh, directly using Elastic MapReduce. And that scales very nicely, depend independent of the data that you have underneath uh, DynamoDB. You can also run Hive query language queries against your data. Uh, so I said earlier that we, don't, we only index on the primary key and the composite key in DynamoDB. That's true. Uh, but you can run more complicated SQL-like queries using Hive using Elastic MapReduce. So this is what a, uh, a Hive query looks like. This is querying live data in DynamoDB. 
Uh, if you're used to using SQL or if you're a Hive expert, uh, then this is obviously going to look familiar to you. So you basically create what's called an external table, and then you query that table as you would uh, some sort of relational store. And you can do that, again, irrespective of the data size inside DynamoDB, because Elastic MapReduce is integrated for low latency access. So live data in DynamoDB accessed, uh, what's that, in just a couple of lines, basically. You can also query DynamoDB uh, directly, uh, like that. And then you can query archive data in S3. So this is another common pattern of working with DynamoDB. Uh, some customers uh, don't need a full, large data set under DynamoDB. And so they'll, uh, they'll, they'll take out that data, put it into cold storage on S3. Uh, but that doesn't mean you lose the ability to run analytics against it. It's cheaper to store it in S3, so you can take it out of DynamoDB, stick it into S3. Uh, but then you can create the same external tables against that data in S3 as you can the live data in DynamoDB. So you create the external table like that, and then you can query uh, that, uh, that, that older data that you don't need live in your data set. You can push it off, lower cost, but still make, uh, take advantage of it from an analytics point of view. And that's the Hive query uh, to, run that, uh, to run a query against data which has been archived out of DynamoDB. You can also export to S3. So you remember I said that you could uh, manage your backups and your restores. Uh, this is how you export from DynamoDB uh, into, uh, into uh, S3 using the Hive query language uh, through Elastic MapReduce. Uh, these slides will be available afterwards, so you don't have to write all of that down and get all the parentheses in the right place. Um, so I think that they're really a perfect match. Elastic MapReduce and DynamoDB open up a whole world of questions that you can ask of this data, uh, which are typically prohibitive to do when you don't have these, these higher-level services available to you. So the last thing I want to talk about uh, around analytics is, uh, is tightly coupled uh, uh, um, workflows, uh, some of the work we've been doing there, some of the new services we've rolled out there. Um, so this typically involves parallel computation rather than just distributed computation, uh, computation which takes uh, place over many, many cores uh, and which requires higher network uh, capacity uh, because all of those cores are talking to all, of the ones, uh, all the other ones at the same time. So this is very common in uh, financial risk analysis, uh, very common in drug discovery. Uh, it's increasingly common, uh, people trying to drive even more value out of how people are playing their games, how people are in interacting with social media, looking for trends within those social media. Uh, manufacturing and design getting fast, uh, uh, throughput fast answers to how your manufacturing process is going on, designing faster and more efficient jet engines, that sort of thing. A lot of work being got done on genomics and, of course, on transcoding and, transcoding and rendering of content as well. So uh, about a year ago, we released CC1. Uh, this is our cluster compute instances. These are the, uh, high, they, at the time, they were the, the, the fastest, uh, most expensive instance that you could provision on EC2. Uh, they were uh, dual quad-core Intel Nahalem processors. Uh, very, very fast, and we threw in some GPUs on those as well. Uh, Animoto are uh, taking advantage of those GPUs to do much more high-def rendering of the videos that they create, for example. And uh, about last November, we announced the second generation, uh, taking everything that we, uh, we learned running CC1 and turning that into the second generation. So these have some really, really nice features uh, in the second generation of our cluster compute instances. Uh, these are, offer 16 Intel Xeon cores per piece. Uh, they offer uh, some placement groups. That means that if you specify uh, what we call a placement group, we'll make sure that these instances are provisioned in uh, the same racks as much as possible, so you get low latency access between the instances. And they run on a full non-blocking, fully bisectional 10 gig -E network. So this is a very fast network which all nodes have access to uh, at 10 gig uh, at the same time. So this is very, very fast, uh, very, very performant. Um, and just to, uh, as a point of comparison, really, uh, before we an announced this, we announced this on, on a, uh, a Saturday or Sunday, I think. And on the Thursday, we ran a large-scale benchmark. Uh, this isn't the whole of EC2. This is a subset of our fleet, of our CC2 instances. Uh, we benchmarked them, see how they, well they performed, and then we submitted that benchmark to uh, the top 500 list. This is a uh, list which is published twice a year of the top performing supercomputers in the world. And just on an elastic network, on something that you could provision tomorrow, uh, we came in at 240 teraflops. Uh, that makes it the 40, 42nd fastest supercomputer in the whole entire world. This is an on-demand resource that anybody can take advantage of. And actually, this is the fastest Ethernet supercomputer. All the rest run on InfiniBand. The fastest Ethernet computer provisioned on demand. If you want to take advantage of this, I can definitely recommend uh, a tool called Star Cluster. Uh, this makes managing uh, distributed tasks in a, in a parallel environment uh, much, much easier. It's available at this web address. And if you want to get started even more quickly, uh, we have a CloudFormation template uh, which will provision uh, a full 64-core uh, cluster for you uh, with a single click. 
Uh, so you can find that on our high performance computing web pages, aws.amazon.com slash HPC. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have around analytics. Yes, sir. If you could just wait for the microphone. Thank you. Uh, when DynamoDB is integrated uh, with Alex Elastic Map Reduce and mm -hmm. you're doing a high H HQL on it, uh, let's, you said there is, if you can't, uh, like if you're not searching on a primary key, let's like you're doing an SQL on another attribute in Dynamo, what does it do underneath? Does it do a scan query or what, what, how does it work? Yeah, so it uses Hive to create what's called an external table and then searches that external table basically. And all that runs on the Elastic MapReduce infrastructure in a distributed fashion. So it does get the whole data, uh, full table scan, dumps everything into a Hadoop and then searches that? That's right, yeah. Right, okay. As far as I know, I think that's right. Okay. Uh, I think we have some over here. Thank you. Um, how about security? I'm kind of used to using firewalls and SSL certificates. Mm -hmm. How does that work on the cloud? Uh, very good question. So the question was around security. Uh, so I will cover security in a, much more, a lot more detail after the coffee break. Uh, uh, including how you can run uh, Elastic MapReduce inside the virtual private cloud where you have full control over all of the network access and all the firewalls and all the identity policies. So the answer is yes. Yes, sir. Uh, I was just wondering uh, how much the sort of 240 teraflop uh, uh, instance would run per hour. Um, Free tier, right, yeah, no. Th that is not covered by the free tier. We should just get that uh, right out there. Uh, honestly, I'm not sure, uh, because I'm not sure how many instances it ran across. So there's around 17,000 cores uh, that it was running on. Um, so uh, you can do the math. But of course, CC2 is also available on the spot market. Uh, so you get to choose the price that you pay for CC2 if you don't mind when your computation runs. Yeah, you can run it through the monthly calculator if you really want to. Glenn will be talking more about that later on. All right, any more? Yes, sir. There's a race on. Privileged. Thank you, Emma. I was just wondering about the nuts and bolts. Um, you said it's easy to get data from EC2 to S3. Um, but how would I get my logs from Apache, from Log4j, et cetera, mm. into S3? Am I going to have to roll my own solution, or are there solutions out there? Uh, that's actually a really good question. That's something we, we have been talking to customers about. So uh, the answer is kind of application dependent. Uh, so there are a number of log rotators uh, that you can use. Uh, so once you rotate your logs on your instances, that's the point at which you take the old logs and throw them onto S3. Then you delete them from the instance once you know that they're up onto S3. Uh, you reduce the running costs of the storage on the instance for a start, but also you put them under highly durable storage on S3, where you can then start to, excuse me, start to ask questions of those, of those logs. Uh, so there are a couple of best practices, and um, the best thing to do would be to talk about your architecture with one of our remarkable solution architects uh, that are here with us today. Uh, but there are, there are a couple of native things, depending on the language that you're, you're working in, and there are a couple of best practices around how you do it. Uh, so talk to a solution architect or, or myself, and we can run through it in, in a bit more detail. But it's actually relatively straightforward. And don't forget, EC2 and S3 are physically co-located. Uh, so you get low latency access uh, for those logs when they move between the two. OK. All right, any more questions about analytics? You can find me in the, in the coffee break. Let's talk about Amazon Simple Workflow. Uh, so we launched this service yesterday. Um, it uh, has been received pretty well. We've got a ton of traffic on our blog, uh, so uh, I'm very happy uh, that we managed to uh, stay up late working on these slides to try and describe to you in a bit more detail what simple Amazon Simple Workflow is. Uh, we call it SWF, uh, how you can use it and where it fits into the broader uh, Amazon platform. Uh, so Simple Workflow, Amazon Simple Workflow, is designed to build, process, and manage workflows, as the name suggests. Uh, so I guess the question is, what is a workflow? Or what do we see as a workflow? Uh, a workflow is basically uh, any kind of process, uh, any kind of uh, effectively application. So this may be a business process. Uh, this may be an analysis pipeline. This may be a transcoding pipeline. It may be just that you want to manage or provision infrastructure in a particular order. 
Uh, but it basically uh, represents uh, a flow of tasks which have to take place in a specific order uh, and which have to be orchestrated in some way. So workflows are really about orchestrating tasks and the data that needs to move between them. But ultimately, the majority of applications encapsulate some kind of workflow or typically a collection of many, many workflows. So a typical workflow might look something like this. Uh, so a new customer uh, might sign up for your application. Uh, a new employee might join your organization. And there's a, a process of steps that you need to take place uh, in a particular order in order to register them fully with either your service or your employment or whatever. So you may want to register their address. You might want to register their billing details if they're going to actually be paying for stuff. You might want to validate those billing details, so go off to the bank and check that they've been uh, correctly entered. Uh, you might want to go off and uh, create their account in a local database or a remote database or a service or LDAP or something like that. And you can imagine this line stretching on for, for a long way. So uh, there's a lot of uh, different states involved in even the most simple task of registering a new customer, for example. Now, the typical way of dealing with this in a, an elastic infrastructure is to start to decouple uh, some of these services. So rather than thinking about just registering an address uh, procedurally, start to decouple it into its own individual services. Uh, these services may be asynchronous. Uh, so you can imagine validating billing details uh, may take more time. You have to go off to the bank. It may even be a manual process in some organizations. So that's highly asynchronous. You have no idea how long it's going to take for that response to come back. Uh, but you've probably got better control over how you create that account internally in your LDAP server in your database. So there's a mixture of asynchronous and, uh, and synchronous tasks which mix together to form very, very complex workflows. Now, in a distributed environment, in an elastic environment, this is typically orchestrated with queues. So you move from one state to another by enqueuing tasks uh, between the different states. So once you've registered address, uh, that's the first thing you kick off in an address registration service. Then you register that the next phase has to take place. You register that takes place in Q1. Uh, then the billing registration happens. Once that's finished, uh, you orchestrate with the billing validation by using a second queue and queuing the task that needs to take place, distributing it out over the billing validation service or the person that needs to do the task or somebody looking something up on MechTurk. Uh, then you go through and orchestrate that with a, a third queue. Um, and it can get pretty complicated pretty quickly. Uh, queues are a good fit for relatively short workflows, uh, but once you start building up application level workflows, they can qu quickly become unwieldy. Uh, so you have to start worrying about the ordering of these tasks and the dependencies between them. You, obviously, you need the billing information before you can validate that billing information. Uh, you need to be able to worry about duplication or deduplication of those messages. Uh, so some messages may be expensive to perform. So actually looking up the billing information may incur a cost. It may take somebody's time to go and fill out the paperwork to get them registered uh, with your legal department, for example. So duplication of messages uh, is something which is very difficult to check for, very difficult to, to manage. But you also need to record all of the metadata so that you know when something has been completed. This talks to uh, the orchestration. This talks to the ordering. But it also talks to the history of the data. You might want to go back and do an audit across this workflow to see what happened at what time and to investigate if uh, there are any improvements that can be made. Um, so that was just with a simple, more or less linear, serial workflow. Um, this I drew as many lines until I got bored. But you can imagine just how complicated some workflows can be. So you can have multiple workflows. Uh, they can integrate at various different points. They can have forks and tasks and, all, and different tasks and all the rest of it. And these tasks need to be done at different scales at different times, synchronously or asynchronously. So uh, this is obviously, uh, as you probably guessed, where we see a lot of undifferentiated heavy lifting. This is a lot of work that our customers are putting in, building out uh, in a number of different ways, whether it's just procedurally in code or in large formal workflow systems with things like Taverna. Uh, undifferentiated work. Right? This is work that you're spending just orchestrating all this stuff, recording the provenance, recording the history, making sure that that's stored. And it's undifferentiated work. You want to be focusing on uh, making those business processes as efficient as possible, making sure that they're meeting the requirements of your business going forwards. So undifferentiated heavy work, this is where we feel we can add value. And so that's where SWF comes in. So SWF uh, is designed for the cloud, first and foremost. Uh, it is built and designed to build uh, scalable and resilient applications, so scalable and resilient uh, workflows. Uh, it can model complex business processes, arbitrarily complex business processes, actually. Uh, but at the same time, we hope that we've built it to be easy to use, and we hope that we've maintained the flexibility that the Amazon platform is well known for. So really, what SWF is all about is task orchestration. So orchestrating a series of tasks which, 
from one end to the other, fulfill a business process. Uh, it's a managed and based on your application logic. Uh, so it will manage the task execution. It will manage the dependencies between those tasks. It'll make sure that they're scheduled in a sensible way, uh, along with the application logic that you specify. And it'll also handle all of the concurrency around that for you as well. And ultimately, again, just like DynamoDB, uh, this is built to be zero administration. So there's no hardware or software to administer for the orchestration piece. Uh, you just have to work with simple workflow service, and uh, it will go off and provision the hardware. It will take care of the software handling. Uh, all you've got to do is worry, on the worry about the business rules. Uh, uh, simple workflow will take care of all the rest of it. So there's a, a new vocabulary uh, for, for, for simple workflow. I thought I'd define a few terms here. Um, so at the sort of top level of the nomenclature is a domain. A uh, domain is basically a collection of workflows. So you can group multiple related workflows together in what we're calling a domain. A workflow, uh, you can think of as a collection of tasks. The tasks are the thing to be orchestrated, and they are built out into what we call a workflow. Uh, an action is the task or the workflow step that must be completed, the state change that must be completed. Uh, the activity workers are the things that are actually going to implement the actions. These are the things that do the work uh, to actually fulfill the action to build out the workflow. And we also have something that we call the decider. And this is the thing, this is the business logic which coordinates uh, all of the rest of the actions. So this is the piece which is actually going to drive and make the decisions about which piece to do, which, what to do next and in what order, all that sort of thing. So Amazon SWF sort of sits uh, here in the middle of the slide. It's going to handle, uh, the main, it's gonna handle and maintain the distributed application state uh, on your behalf. It'll track workflow executions for you so you don't lose that provenance and that metadata. It'll ensure consistency of execution history. It will provide visibility into those executions. Again, not something that you get with ad hoc solutions, and quite a lot of work to build that up. Uh, it'll hold and dispatch tasks, depending on your application logic, and it'll provide control over that task distribution uh, whilst uh, retaining the execution history on your behalf. So a lot of this is, work, is built around orchestration. A lot of it is work around uh, just managing the metadata and managing the audit trail of running it. Uh, but this is what it actually looks like. So, SWF sits up there on the AWS cloud. Uh, you can have a number of workers uh, for a particular activity. Uh, they can run on the AWS cloud too. They might be implemented as uh, a mechanical Turk task if you want to, someone to go off and transcribe some data. Uh, they could just be sitting on EC2 instances. Uh, you receive tasks uh, and process them on EC2. Uh, you can also uh, basically push those tasks out to any other number of devices. Uh, so you may want to make uh, a phone call through something like the Twilio API, collect up some more data, uh, make some checks and balances against mobile data, so you can have workers on activity too. These can be real humans. Uh, but you can also run it against your on-premise infrastructure as well. So if you have a number of business logic services uh, that are running on-premise, as long as they can see the HTTP endpoint of the simple workflow service, uh, they can run on-premise as well. So you can start to lash together uh, people, the cloud, and on-premise uh, solutions uh, into a larger orchestration piece. And the decider sits on top here. The decider is the thing which is going to poll effectively the simple workflow service, check the running state of the application, and make decisions about what should happen next. And all that happens is your workers poll the service so they get the activity tasks for them to complete. They just ask the simple workflow, saying, I am a worker for this particular activity. What jobs do I have to do next? That's all they have to do. Very, very straightforward. And you can write those deciders, write, sorry, write those workers in any language that you want. Same with mobile, same with on-premise. Uh, the decider then will poll for decision tasks. Uh, so it will check the running state of the application and say, right, what decision tasks do I have to make? It will poll that. All you have to do is be able to see uh, the SWF endpoint, poll for it, and it will collect up all the state of the running application in order to be able to make the decision and sort of uh, navigate those decision trees. So that's where your business logic sits. Again, that can be run in, uh, in any uh, on-premise or in the cloud. Uh, that can be run in any language that you want. So it's a nice, flexible way, and it will just return decisions about what to do next, what needs to be enqueued, what is the state of the workflow going forwards. So what this ends up with is a very clean separation. So you end up with a decoupled uh, task logic from application flow. All your workers have to worry about is implementing the work that they have to do, uh, whilst the decider has to implement the logic and the flow of the application. So it's nicely encapsulated in these different ways, makes it much easier to scale out, makes it much easier to uh, fail over, and it makes it much easier to develop and much easier to write. Uh, we also have um, some scales. So you can scale your workers and deciders because they're stateless. They don't need to know the full running state. So if one of them fails, you can checkpoint that 
and pick it up where it, where it, where it left off. Uh, you can scale them out using auto-scaling in the same way as you would any other EC2. And we have support for what we are calling signals and errors. Uh, so signal is basically an um, out-of-bound signal uh, that you can place into the audit history. Uh, that, will tell it, uh, the dis that will be issued by a decider or one of the workers to say, hey, I did this. And you can enter that into the state of the application. We also have configurable timeouts. Uh, so if something fails along the way, uh, you can decide how to handle that again in your application logic. You might want to just retry. You might want to do an exponential back off, that sort of thing. And we have markers in place so that you can checkpoint where applications or where a running task got to uh, before it failed, for example. This is what it looks like on the website. Uh, this is the default page. Uh, we're getting better at building these things out, I think. Um, you can launch a, sa a sample walkthrough. And again, I highly recommend you uh, spend some of your 25 bucks uh, on the sample walkthrough. That will spin up a collection of uh, workflow tasks, uh, a workflow, sorry, and a, a collection of decider and uh, 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 activity tasks and show you how they all fit together. Or you can just go ahead and start creating your own domain. Uh, you just have to give it uh, the name of what you want to do and the retention period for the history. In, in the number of days, and you give it a friendly description as well. And after that, you unlock the wonders of the Simple Workflow dashboard. Here, you can basically track all of the execution states of all of your running activities, uh, workers, and deciders. Um, up there in the top right will appear your, um, your CloudWatch metrics. We're collecting metrics along all of this for you as well. And you can see the backlog of what's running, what is pending, and all the rest of it. So you get a good overview of the running state of your workflows. When you want to create a new workflow, uh, you just create a workflow like this. You give it a name. Uh, you can, we have versions of workflows, again, tracking that provenance, tracking that history. Uh, you can give it a default task list, uh, and you can set the timeouts uh, so you can track the failures. So the workflow timeout is the default execution of the entire workflow, and then you can have individual task timeouts as well, and handle those as well. Then you can register an activity. Uh, this is a point in the workflow. And again, you can spe specify the timeout. Uh, you can specify uh, what we're calling a task list, which is a collection of these tasks, uh, the orchestration. Uh, you might think of it as a queue name. And the name and the version as well. After that, you can query what you're doing, and you can just run new workflows uh, once they're up and running. And uh, they will go off and distribute those tasks over, out over your infrastructure. All of this, again, delivered in a pay-as-you-go model, as you might expect. And here is the pricing. Uh, so that is one one hundredth of a cent per workflow, and you'll pay 0 0.005 cents uh, per day for any workflow that is running over 24 hours. Uh, it's that number of zeros and 25 per task, so I think that's a quarter of a thousandth of a cent per task, signal, or marker, and you'll pay 10 cents per gigabyte for the first gigabyte of inbound traffic. Uh, the first gigabyte out is free, and then it's normal AWS usage prices after that. So that's what you're going to pay for running these things. We also have a free tier to help you get started with this as well. So we'll give you 1,000 workflow executions, 10,000 tasks, 10 timers, signals, and markers, and 30,000 workflow execution days in order to be able to run it. So you can start building out actually reasonably complex business processes uh, using simple workflow and keep them under the free tier. Uh, in addition to that, to help you take advantage of this, we have something which we're calling the Flow Framework. Uh, this is a Java abstraction of the Simple Workflow service. Uh, so it lets you deal with activities and workers and deciders in a much more native Java-friendly way. Uh, and I thought you might like to hear about a uh, use case. Uh, this is one of my all-time favorite AWS use cases. Uh, this is by our, our friends at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, NASA JPL. Um, and it concerns this little guy. Uh, so this is one of their Mars rovers. Um, this, I forget the name of this one, but uh, the important part is up here. Uh, this is a stereo camera uh, which sits on top of the Mars rover. Uh, the robotics of the Mars rover are kind of complicated, uh, but it's this stereo camera uh, which basically drives the robot's movements uh, when it's on Mars. This is all done on Mars, right? So what happens is the little Mars rover uh, moves to where it wants to go. It'll park up, and it'll take a, an image uh, with both the left eye and the right eye of its stereo camera. After that, it's a workflow. And NASA are running this exact workflow live on Simple Workflow at the moment. So they take the left image, they warp it to the terrain. They take the right image, they warp it to the domain. There's a dependency here because both the left and the right images have to have been received from Mars to AWS. They have to be warped to, to the terrain. And then they can be matched. So they do a stereo match against the two images. They use that match to build out a 3D map. And then they tile that across the entire terrain. And uh, this is pretty much what it looks like. So this is a two gigapixel image uh, that NASA creates uh, using these stereo images. Uh, it pans across. You can see the little tracks of the robot there coming across the screen like that. 
And uh, the, uh, the tactical team back at NASA, uh, using this workflow, uh, execute the next workflow along, which is where they basically uh, decide where they want the Mars rover to move to next. Uh, it will compute the exact movement uh, so they can move around rocks and they know the exact distance and the altitude that the robot's going to move through because they've done all of the analytics on top of the images that have been received and all of that is done through uh, the simple workflow service. Uh, so that is a, um, a robot moving on Mars, all powered by SWF. I think that's fantastic. Uh, and on that, I can open it up for any Q&A. Any questions on simple workflow? There's one at the back. Yes, sir. Oh, there's one over here. Sorry. Yes, sir. Hi, yeah, um, I'm interested to see that obviously there's quite a lot of uh, potential for kind of business logic going into this kind of workflow thing. And mm -hmm. if we're doing that in a kind of traditional environment, we'd be being good software developers and writing lots of functional tests, business driven development approach, Glue test first, well, and that kind of thing to prove that our logic was correct. Mm -hmm. What kind of support is there existing or planned for kind of allowing tests and proving the mm -hmm. correctness of the, of the logic? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So um, the answer is really that you can, you can run these on uh, any number of data sets, right? So each workflow could take an input, for example. And whilst you might want to run that input against production code uh, or production data uh, or in a production environment, uh, those input parameters might specify a test environment in which you know the outcome of the workflow, right? So all you have to do is run the workflow against your test data set, just as you would in any other integration or, or, or QA test and make sure that the result you get at the other end is what you expect. Uh, so testing is sort of built in, and of course you can automate this. So every time you make a check into your code, uh, you update your decider, you update any of your, your business processes around that, you can automatically kick off through the API the run of the test workflow uh, to make sure that your, it's just another integration test on your continuous integration pool. Any more? Yes, sir. An extension of that sort of question, really, which is um, you're moving more and more into the platform as a service kind of environment, um, and the thing that uh, you don't have that, say, an Azure or an App Engine may have is a on-premise, on-my-laptop kind of runtime environment that allows me to simulate it. So I think in, in continuation of that question, being able to sort of step through and debug and to kind of do unit testing locally before yeah. deploying into a kind of a full environment, um, that's the sort of thing that's kind of not there, and I, I'm not sure if that's kind of what he was driving at too. Sure. So I, I, I take your point. Uh, we're actually seeing uh, we're actually seeing customers move in the opposite direction. We're seeing customers move much more of their dev and test environments up onto AWS, just because it's a more flexible way of encapsulating the different environments that they're working with. Uh, but I absolutely take your point. Any more? Yes, sir. How the um, workflow management is fair, uh, um, cope with the, uh, 